tonight I'd like to talk to you about something simple, playing and why we play. If you're Derek Jeter, there's a very straightforward answer to that question. You play to win. Whether he was playing a baseball game for the Yankees, board game with his friends, or just watching Jeopardy on the couch, Derek Jeter hated to lose above all else. And that worked out well for him. He's one of the winningest athletes in modern times. But that's not the only way to play. In fact, when I was young, I hated to lose just as much as Derek Jeter. My dad will still remind me to this day that three-year-old Joe would cheat at Hi Ho Cheerio just to avoid losing. But then when I started playing organized sports, something interesting happened. I became a goalie. For those of you who aren't familiar, goaltending is a terrible, terrible position that forces you to fail a lot. You could be playing a perfect game and have a shutout going, only for the pucker ball to bounce off your teammate and into the back of your net. There's nothing you really could have done about it, but it's still your fault. So after seeing plenty of goals go past me, which I still hate more than anything, I learned something. What I hated about losing was feeling like I had done something wrong or like I wasn't good enough. But I also learned that failure is part of sports and it's part of life. And what matters is how you respond to that. You can lose and not be a loser. But learning from sports isn't something that just happened to me. In his Republic, Plato <laughs> talked about how education needs both physical and literary components. Those two had to remain in balance though, because a purely physical education would neglect a man's mind and a purely literary education would leave his body indecently soft. But Plato's education was about producing a good person, a good leader, a good warrior. And for Plato, the idea of good was linked with truth. And from an experiential perspective, that makes sense. Sometimes the best way to learn something is just to do it. It's one thing to have a literary definition of a virtue, let's say fortitude, meaning strength in a difficult or painful situation. And it's another thing to know it through your own personal experiences, maybe by refusing to quit in a wrestling match against an opponent who's stronger than you. But in his laws, Plato also wrote that the first and best victory is the mastery of self. And we can see that in his famous allegory of the cave, which explains how you move from seeing shadows we think of as the truth to the actual truth. Not only do you have to get yourself out of the cave, but you have to learn to see in the light. And it's a struggle, but you're better for doing it. Not only do you understand the virtues better, but you understand yourself and how you relate to them. Writing in the 1700s, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said similar things about experiential learning in his treatise on education. He said that a child should be left as alone as possible for the first few years of their life so they could learn through doing. And while some of his examples, like letting a child go outside in the cold, may seem a little silly today, they still hold water. If you let a child go outside in the cold, they not only gain something physical, they're hardened against the elements, but they gain larger, more conceptual skills. Maybe the next time they'll remember to bring a coat. That's preparation. <laughs> or the next time they find themselves in a difficult situation, they'll be able to think back to this situation and how they got through it. Those are all things learned by doing. And the developmental psychologists like Piaget and Kohlberg, they said that social skills were learned through peer interactions. If there's an adult involved, there's fundamentally a power dynamic. The child will defer to them out of respect for their authority and the fear of being labeled a bad boy or girl. But when there are two peers interacting, either party can refuse the other. So you're not only learning things like how to coexist in a group, but you're learning larger concepts, such as how to lead and how to be led. And even today, sports and children are still linked together. And we think that's a great thing. Like, there's about 21 million athletes in grades K through 8 in America, and we <laughs> love that. We think it's great that your child joins the swim team to learn about teamwork or plays tennis to make friends and stay in shape. But once you get beyond those grades, participation starts to taper off. In high school, there's only about 7 million athletes. So why does that happen? A lot of it comes down to talent. Once winning becomes a goal, you simply have to be good enough to make the team. But there are other factors. There's the idea that you should be studying more instead of spending it every afternoon to the gym or that you might get hurt playing a sport like football, and sometimes you just don't want to play anymore. And then that tr those trends continue when you get onto college. Not only is the, are the participation numbers even smaller with just about 46,000 athletes, but here's where we start to see the balance that Plato talked about disappearing. You have situations where players go to college not to learn, not to be part of a great team, but as a means to make it to the pros the next year. 
you have situations where one person becomes bigger than the entire program, like how Joe Paterno was untouchable in the Jerry Sandusky abuse scandal at Penn State. And you have plenty of situations where winning becomes the goal put above all else. Just last month, the Syracuse men's basketball program was hit by the NCAA for a multitude of violations, including academic fraud. And even here at NYU, point shaving scandals first in the 50s and then in the 60s proved to be the beginning of the end of our men's basketball team. And then when you get to the pros, everything continues even further. Not only are there just about 15,000 athletes, but you get guys like Alex Rodriguez, who do things like deny using steroids, then admit to using steroids and serve a one-year suspension, and then rejoin their team a year later as if nothing has happened. So with situations like that happening seemingly every day, you might ask, why does sports still matter? Why does someone like me still think they're important? And for that, I love to refer to American philosopher and theologian Michael Novak and what he wrote in his essay, The Joy of Sport. He said that sport gets to the heart of the human existence, and there's a certain truth that comes with it. There's nothing like the smack of a baseball off of the fat, true center of a bat. And if you think back to those virtues we touched on earlier, we have a tendency to intellectualize them, look at them passively and from afar. This historical figure showed great camaraderie. This philosopher said X about fortitude. And that's great, but something can be learned from doing it and experiencing it and feeling it for yourself. For example, we can look at this image of the Spartans and understand their camaraderie before a great battle. Or we could play sports and feel the bond with your teammates that grow over a long season. You could look at Botticelli's fortitude and see a strong woman in a suit of armor who wasn't ready to back down from anything. Or you could play sports and refuse to quit when seemingly everything is against you. Or you could look at the oxbow and how it captures the sublime, that moment of awe that's sort of outside our ability to articulate. Or you can play sports and do things that the human body, by all accounts, shouldn't be able to do. It all comes back to that idea of balance that we talked about with Plato. Plato loved the academy and he loved philosophy, but he was also a wrestler and would want you to wrestle or throw the frisbee around or go play some pickup basketball. It's a balance of both and how you learn from both together. So to conclude, I'd like to ask you to do something simple. You might not have been asked this in a while, even though you might wish you had been. Go outside and play. Thank you.